its team. Awesome. Okay, I should be sharing my screen. Is that all okay, Taylor? Yep. All cool. good. Yep. Okay, welcome everybody at London XL Meetup, February 2022. Uh, we have Dave uh, Langer here to take us through some hands on data literacy for Excel users. I'll just go for my normal introduction for everybody, and then we'll get down to business, or David will anyway. So um, upcoming events, uh, just the one kind of booked in at the moment, which will be confirmed soon. Uh, I do have quite a few other events that are kind of not confirmed, but close, <laughs> just ironing the kind of creases out on them. Uh, but next month, we have another online event uh, where we have Stephanie Evergreen coming uh, to do some chart stuff, must know chart hacks in Excel. So that should be uh, going public soon. It's not on the uh, Meetup site yet, although it is uh, confirmed. So I'll probably add that later in the week. Uh, so lock out the date now and keep your eye out so you can RSVP for that straight away. And more events coming soon, hopefully, if I can get them over the line. And then the usual things to note. So first of all, that we are being streamed live on YouTube at the moment as well. Uh, so we're here in Zoom, we're here in uh, kind of YouTube. It's always a good backup. And the replay will be there as well. There are links to both of these in the Meetup description. Uh, there always are. So the same YouTube link that is in the Meetup like event description is the same one that will have the replay of the event. So you will be sent this afterwards as well, although you are, you'll only get receive it if you've RSVP'd for this. Which, uh, bullet point three is telling you there. The email only goes to people who are RSVP for the event, but you can access the YouTube replay if you need to see any of this back for any reason. You know, if you miss something or you want to watch it again, uh, is in the Meetup event page. Obviously, after today, it will slip to a past event. You'll have to find it uh, a bit more, but it'll be there. Yeah, and everyone will get that follow-up email. And there's not really um, anything else for me to say. Uh, pretty short and sweet. I've got to jump over and help Taylor with uh, admitting people into here. And um, Dave, if you're ready to kind of take over and introduce yourself and we'll get down to some data business. I am. Let me go ahead and share my screen now. Super, cheers Dave. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Awesome. So I am super stoked to be talking to you guys today about one of my favorite subjects. But before I do that, I have to apologize in advance. If you've never seen any of my content before, I tend to be a little bit um, a little bit on the enthusiastic side. That's the word I'll use, enthusiastic. So please forgive me in advance if, if I seem a little bit over the top. That's just the way I roll. So I want to talk to you guys today about data literacy. And I want to talk about a practical guide for data literacy because I believe as I was mentioning to Alan and Taya before everybody got on the Zoom here, that I believe firmly that in the future, businesses are going to expect a certain level of data literacy in terms of skills, just like they assume skills with Word, Excel, and PowerPoint today. And that goes far beyond just being able to read a chart, doing a pivot table. Those things are all awesome, don't get me wrong, but I think the expectation is going to be a little bit higher. So what we're going to talk about today is a practical choose your own adventure approach that any professional with basic Excel skills can take to determine how much data literacy, how many, how much skills with data they would like to have. So I'm really super excited to talk to you about this today. I'm also pretty informal. So feel free to pop questions in the chat and Alan and Taya, they'll, they can just interrupt me anytime and say, hey Dave, we got a question and we'll just stop and answer the question in place and then we'll move on with the presentation. So just a bit about me, uh, I've been around a long time. So I've been in technology more than 25 years now. It's kind of painful to say that out loud, but it's true. <laughs> With more than 10 years in hands-on analytics. So right now, these days, I am a founder of a 
solopreneur business. I am a consultant and educator in the analytics space. But before that, I had hands-on analytics leadership roles at companies like Schedulicity, Data Science Dojo, and Microsoft. No, I never worked in the Excel team, but I did work in the SQL Server team. So hopefully that gives me some street cred there. Uh, I'm also a YouTuber and what I like to call a LinkedIn enthusiast. So if you like what you see today and you want to follow more of my content, you can check me out there. Um, if you have any questions, any questions at all, ask them in the chat, or you can just drop me an email, dave at davevondata.com. I love to hear from folks and have a conversation. So first up, before we can talk about data literacy, we need to talk about analytics. And many of you might have seen this kind of conceptual framework, but these days we talk a lot about analytics, data analysis in four buckets. So this is a very commonly used framework to kind of categorize the kinds of things that you use data to do within organizations. And we've got descriptive and diagnostic, predictive analytics. Ooh, this is the big one, right? Machine learning, AI, everybody's talking about this one. And we also have prescriptive analytics. So if you're not familiar with what these things mean, we can talk about them in very specific terms. So first up, there's descriptive analytics. And that the way to think about descriptive analytics is you're trying to use data to understand what happened in the past in the business or in your organization, if maybe if you're not in a for-profit or, uh, organization. And this is basically table stakes, right? So this is things like, can you read a chart? Can you read a table? Can you do a pivot? That sort of thing. And descriptive analytics is foundational. It's table stakes. And it most often takes various forms in organizations. So for example, you might have Excel reports. You literally might have Excel files flying around on email or through Slack or whatever it might be. You might also have things like executive dashboards, which tend to be relatively static. You know, executives come in, they look at sales and costs and that sort of thing. And of course, you can never get away from it. PowerPoint, <laughs> right? PowerPoint is still one of the most common communication mechanisms there is, especially if you're communicating with managers. They love PowerPoint. And this is all about the what. Sales were up, sales were down, the product launch was great, that sort of thing. That's table stakes. But you want to typically move beyond that if you want to be a truly data literate professional. This was, this was great back in the 90s and the early 2000s, but we've kind of moved on into these more advanced areas. So we can think of diagnostic analytics as kind of an extension, a natural evolution of descriptive analytics. And this is all about answering the why. Why of what happened in the past? So for example, maybe this will resonate with you guys, I don't know, based on your professional experiences, uh, something didn't go as planned. So a manager wants to know why it didn't go as well as planned. So that's where diagnostic analytics comes in. Let's say sales are down. Why were sales down? So you use diagnostic analytics to speed lunk into the data and figure out some of the why. And these take various forms. So for example, BI dashboards, business intelligence dashboards, whether those are in Excel or Power BI or Tableau or whatever it might be, are often used in figuring out the why. Excel workbooks, Absolutely still very common. In fact, maybe even more common still today than BI dashboards, despite all the hype. You might also use formal analytics tools to do this. And by the way, Excel is an analytics tool, as you will learn today. But things like R or SAS, SPSS, Python, that sort of thing are often used in this case. And not surprising, there's PowerPoint still there because sometimes you need to communicate your diagnostic analytics results to a manager and they like PowerPoint. So you might just cut and paste some stuff into PowerPoint and do a presentation. So this is diagnostic analytics. You're moving from the what. This is like basically reading data, essentially, to moving to, can I use data? Can I work with it? Can I analyze it? Next up, we have predictive analytics. And that is simply just this idea of, can we use data to understand what is likely to happen in the future? Now, this, this word is really super important, likely, because when you start working with predictive analytics, despite what some of the hype might tell you, all of this is kind of a, kind of a crapshoot in the end, right? It's all probabilistic kinds of modeling. It's never guaranteed to happen, but it's extremely useful because understanding what's likely to happen is useful. Think of a weather report. The weather reports are always 
off to a certain degree, but they're still useful. Same idea. And once again, via dashboards, Excel workbooks, analytic tools, and PowerPoint. And lastly, we have prescriptive analytics. This is a very tried and true old school data analysis technique. It really got started back in World War II to plan logistics optimally for the, the allies during World War II. So it's been around a long time, but it's still as valuable today as it always has been. And essentially it's this idea of like, can you use data to tell you exactly what to do, how to optimize the business? And one of the most powerful and useful tools in this space, by the way, is Excel, the solver. I don't know how many of you use the solver, but it is awesome. It's one of the best things to learn how to use in Excel that there is. And you can do optimization things like, hey, I'm a manufacturer. How should I optimize my inventory for maximum pick rate in the warehouse? Or how should I set my distribution centers up to minimize my shipping costs? You know, that sort of thing. Excel is awesome at that. There are entire books written about how to do this sort of thing in Excel. Now, of course, you can also use analytics tools like R and that sort of thing as well. And of course, <laughs> you're never going to get away from PowerPoint because you got to communicate with executives and they like PowerPoint. So this is the base framework. This is how you can think about data literacy along a spectrum from you know table stakes all the way to like very advanced stuff. Now, to understand what it means to be a truly data literate professional, we can overlay this idea that True data literacy starts here. This is insufficient. You have to be able to analyze data to be truly literate with data. Analysis. So you have to be able to analyze data. Doesn't mean you have to go all the way over here. For many people, this might be enough. Some people might want a little bit of predictive analytics because predictive analytics is actually quite helpful in understanding the why of what's going on in the business. And we'll talk more about that later. And I'll pause in case there's any questions. Shout out me, Alan or T, if there's any questions. If not, I'll just no keep questions going. Yet, no questions. All right, sweet. Bring your hard questions up. Don't hesitate. All right, so we've got that framework, right? These four chevrons around this, this continuum of data analysis. So let's say that you're interested in building some skills in diagnostic analytics or predictive analytics, which is where we're going to focus on in this presentation, by the way, is in those two middle chevrons. The great news is, is that to become data literate, you can implement this choose your own adventure approach, which I'll talk about in a second. And you only, you only need two things. I only make two assumptions about you on this slide. First up, that you have Excel skills. And I'm not talking about anything fancy, right? I'm not talking about VBA. I'm not talking about advanced Power Query or DAX or anything like that. If you've got basic skills, if you can work with tables, pivot tables, some pivot charts maybe, uh, if you're comfortable writing reasonably complicated formulas in cells, that's it. That's all you need. But secondarily, this is even more important. You're going to be building new skills. So you have to be motivated to put in the time. You got you to learn. You got to practice. So it takes some time. So that's all you need, some basic Excel skills and motivation. And you can go ahead and do the Morpheus thing and take the red pill and see how far down the data literacy rabbit hole you'd like to go. So first up, in this choose your own adventure approach is this idea of what I call the data user. Can you use, can you use data effectively to actually analyze data? And all you really need, oddly enough, to establish this diagnostic level of analytics is skills with Excel data visualization. Now to be sure, we're going to use examples in this deck and I have more examples in, in, that I'll talk about later on if you decide to learn some more about this, where you're going to use data visualizations in Excel that aren't commonly seen, right? They're very powerful, but they're not commonly used. So that's the difference, right? So it's, we're not talking about a simple bar chart necessarily. We're talking about other things as well. But data visualization is actually at the heart of diagnostic analytics. Can you use visualizations and drill in the data and get new insights that explain the why of what's going on in the business? And we'll talk... We'll have a couple examples here shortly of what I'm talking about here. And for some professionals, that's all they need. That's all the data literacy they need, and they're golden. And that's totally cool. But for some, they may want more power. They may want to be able to answer more interesting business questions using Excel. So they might move to the next level of this choose your own adventure framework, which is what I call the power user. And what we do is we augment this data visualization skills to do diagnostic analytics with what I call business analysis. Now, unfortunately, this is a 
overloaded term depending on who you talk to. But in my case, I have a very specific definition of business analysis and it's enumerated down here. Do you know about business processes? Do you understand the business processes exhibit variation? A certain amount of numeric literacy, don't panic. I'm not talking about anything fancy here. Do you know what an average is? Do you know what an average is versus a median? You know, that sort of thing, real simple stuff. Some data visualizations, for example, line charts, extremely useful in diagnostic analytics. And, but mostly what I'm talking about here is a particular charting technique that's known as a process behavior chart. If you're familiar with my content at all, you know I talk about this incessantly and I will be talking about it again today. And what's cool about this chart is that it is super simple. Anybody can learn how to use it with basic Excel skills. No, no complicated math is required. No programming is required. And you can do very cool analyses like comparing groups. And we'll talk more about this later, but like you can conduct, conduct a statistical analysis without using any statistics really, oddly enough, and compare groups. It's powerful, powerful stuff. And then lastly is the third stage, right? You've taken that red pill and you've gone all the way down the data literacy rabbit hole to what I call the citizen business analyst. And what we do is we throw into the mix some predictive analytics. We throw in logistic regression and linear regression. And once again, don't panic. As you'll see, these are things you can learn how to do in Excel and they are not that difficult. I'll explain more of that later. But when taken as a whole, when you have all of these skills, this starts to look an awful lot like a skill set that a data analyst or a data scientist would have, which is why I call it a citizen business analyst, because you don't have that formal data title, but you're using the same tools and techniques, and you are also having the same impact with data that those formal data roles have. So this is you choose your own adventure approach. We're going to go through all four of these chevrons in this particular deck tonight. So let's start up with data visualization. So first up, Excel is a wildly, wildly useful data visualization tool. And this is coming from somebody who initially, as I mentioned to Alan and Taya earlier before the start of the call, when I first started as a software engineer, I hated Excel. I thought it was the most evil thing in the world and I wanted to get rid of it. I wanted to get it out of, out of the company that I worked for. And I was passionate about that. Much later on, once I moved into analytics, I started to realize that Excel is everywhere for a reason. It is a wildly powerful tool and data visualizations is one aspect of that power. So it, Excel, it can create data visualizations that are commonly used by statisticians and data scientists and data analysts in more sophisticated, I'll air quote that, sophisticated tools like R, Python, SAS, SPSS, things like that, it can create the same types of data visualizations. As I said earlier, you don't see them frequently in Excel workbooks, and that's a crying shame because they are extremely powerful. All this means is that Excel is actually a very useful diagnostic analytics tool. You don't need to move to Power BI. You don't need to move to Tableau. I used to work at Microsoft, by the way, as I mentioned. So sorry, Microsoft, it's true. You don't have to move to Power BI. You can stay in Excel and do a lot. So it is an extremely powerful tool. So I want to give you a couple examples. So one, of, one example of a chart that you can create, a visualization you can create in Excel that you don't see very often, is a box plot. And this thing is mighty. It is an awesome diagnostic tool. So here's an example. Now. Even if you don't know what a box plot is, even if you don't know how to read it, and it has a very specific set of semantics. Later on in the, in the presentation, I'll show you um, some resources on my YouTube channel where you can learn how to build and read these. But even if you don't know how to read them, you can just look at it and start to understand something that's going on. So real quickly, this visualization is from a famous machine learning data set that has data about flowers in particular iris flowers. And what this visualization is showing you is the measurements associated with how wide the petals are on these various flowers by the type of flower. So along the x-axis here, we have Setosa iris flowers, Versicolor iris flowers, and Virginica iris flowers in the data set. And on the y-axis, we have their petal width. And boom, right away, you start to see insight. You start to see some 
understanding of what's going on in the pedal whip, because you can see here clearly that Satosas have narrow pedals. They have small pedal widths. Versicolors are in the middle. Virginica is a little bit bigger. And even though you don't necessarily know how to read the chart, you can also tell that there is no overlap between these two groups whatsoever. They are cleanly separated. That's often very interesting from an analytical perspective. You can also tell just intuitively that there's only a small amount of overlap here with these little lines and the big fat boxes are disjoint. So that right there, it shows you that there's a lot of insight that be, can be gleaned from this particular data visualization. This is an example of something that's very useful from a diagnostic perspective, but is not commonly seen in Excel workbooks. So this is one of my favorites. Now, one thing I need to mention here, which is really super important when you start moving into this idea of like, I'm going to analyze data with data visualizations, is you need to think about the number of columns of data. So you got a table in Excel and you got a number of columns of data in those tables. You need to think about how many how many columns of data am I using simultaneously in my data visualization? So for example, we've got two columns of data here, right? We have one column, which is a bunch of numbers, which is the pedal width. And then we have a text column, which has just labels, Satosa and Versicolor. So we have two columns of data. That's also referred to as two dimensions of data, two columns, right? X and Y. So this is a two-dimensional visualization. And typically what you see when you move into diagnostic analytics is that to get to the why, to really understand what's going on in the business using data, you need more and more dimensions. The more dimensions you add to your visualization, the more powerful they are. And we'll see an example of this in the next slide. Okay, next up, this is what's known as a scatter plot. Now, you can create these in Excel. Unfortunately, my former employer has not made creating this particular visualization particularly easy. You can do it. It's a bit of a manual process. It's, it's clunky, but it's not super difficult. But this is a wildly useful data visualization. This is the thing that is commonly used, for example, by data analysts and data scientists to understand what's going on in the data. So let's think about this from a dimensional perspective. How many columns of data are we using at the same time? So first up, I've got my first dimension along the x-axis. Again, we're using this flower data, this iris flower data here, and we can see petal length. That's on my x-axis. Now, the second dimension is my y-axis, right? This is vertical, and I've got petal width here. And notice that the color coding of the dots on the scatter plot is the third dimension. I've taken a text column, a categorical column of data in my Excel table, and mapped it onto this visualization. And not surprisingly, being a seriously contrived example, as you would expect, boom, right? Data visualization at its best, right? We're tapping into our visual cortex in our brain, and we automatically are drawn to these clusters that I've now circled based on colors. Right? So this is a type of cluster analysis right here, essentially, just using a data visualization. And what we can see here once again is blue is the Satosa flower type. And they have not only small petal widths, like we saw on the last slide, but also small petal lengths simultaneously. Versicolor or orange, they're in the middle here. And then there's some overlap with the Virginicas. This is an example of diagnostic analytics using Excel visualizations at its best. This is a chart that you very, very rarely see in Excel workbooks, and that is unfortunate because this is a very common data exploration technique, as I mentioned, using, using machine learning for, for predictive modeling. And if it's good for data analysts and data scientists, it's probably good for any business professional interested in having more impact at work with data. So this is another example of this idea that you can take your data literacy game with Excel up to the next level using some pretty simple techniques. Okay, so when I first graduated from university a really, really long time ago, <laughs> my first professional job was working at a call center in a bank. So call center analogies, call center examples have a uh, they have a near and dear place in my heart. So to really cement these ideas that I'm going to be talking about for each one of those chevrons that I mentioned earlier, 
I'm going to use the example of, let's say that you or me, we work as a call center manager. Right? We manage a call center. And we're interested in leveling up our data literacy so that we can have more impact at work with data. We want to, we want to be more successful. And we think data can help us with that. So what we'll see here is throughout the rest of the, the deck is as we add more and more of these data literacy skills, we can, in, we can attack and answer more interesting business questions. So let's start with what we can do as a call center manager, just using some of these data visualization techniques that I talked about. So for example, we can ask, hey, do median call lengths vary by geography? So for example, we can use that box plot that I showed and we can have geography along the x-axis, the Northwest region, the central region, the East region, whatever it might be. And then those blue boxes that we saw show us the distribution of the call lengths. So we can understand things like, hey, is there any difference between where the inbound calls come from in terms of their complexity? Because oftentimes call length is a proxy for the complexity of the customer service that needs to be delivered. That's a powerful insight. Maybe geography, maybe you do that visualization and you don't really see anything significant. That's totally cool, right? That's all good. Then you might switch it over to product line. So for example, if you're in a bank, calls for checking account questions versus home mortgages versus uh, 401k questions, those probably all have different levels of complexity and they might have actual call length distributions. And that might be a very interesting insight for you as a call manager so you can allocate your resources appropriately. And then once you get the hang of it, you can throw all kinds of factors in there that you can think of, right? Or you could even put combinations of categories along that x-axis to get all kinds of insights that pop visually. Now, this one's really super cool. This one um, is near and dear to my heart based on my, my first job out of college. Imagine that you're the call center manager and you're like, you're interested in understanding, are there any discernible patterns? Is there anything I can see in the data of how long the calls are taking. When I compare that by NSAT, and if you're not familiar, this is net satisfaction. It's a common metric used in call centers. So customer satisfaction, essentially, by agent. So imagine, if you will, I've got one of those scatter plots again, right, that are color-coded. And I've color-coded the dots based on who the agent is. So for example, Sally, Bob, and Frank. And what I want to see, obviously, is I want to see NSAT up high and I want my call length to be low because what that means is that, that particular call didn't take much time and it delivered a lot of satisfaction to the customer. And let's say I see a cluster of points from Sally in the visualization, right? And the other two guys, they're all over the place. As a call center manager, that might be a cue for me to go to the call center logs to pull Sally's call recordings and listen to what she's doing listen to how she's handling customers because that might inform me, hey, there's some training that I can give the rest of the floor to emulate Sally's success. So that's- Or, or because I worked in call centers and you're getting me kind of worked up here. You go get the logs and find out that when a call gets too complicated, she lies and says, you got the wrong department. I got to put you back in a queue. Because that happened to me. People start gaming the system. And that's where I wonder if you're going to talk about taking this data too sacrosanct. Because sometimes the data can be misleading and you don't see that people are gaming the system. Things don't look as good as they seem to be in these charts and things. It's a, it's a fair point. Oz brings up a very, very interesting point. This deck is going to be exceedingly positive and optimistic. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, but the point you bring up is valid. And if, if you follow my content on LinkedIn, you, I talk about this a lot, right? Um, this idea that if you focus too much on the data and KPIs in particular, you can actually get into a management by metrics problem where, yes, maybe Sally is awesome because she's constantly just kicking calls to somebody else. Or maybe she's just hanging up on people. Who knows, right? Yeah. But but for the Thanks sake for of this, Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. But for the sake of this talk, I'm going to be positive. <laughs> but your, your points are extremely valid. Absolutely valid. Great question. Or observation, for that matter. Either way. Go ahead and contribute to the conversation, please. Okay. So that was like the first Chevron, right? 
So let's say that you're the call center manager and you find all kinds of cool stuff in the data, maybe good, maybe bad. And you're like, hey, I'm addicted. I want to learn more of this data stuff. So you decide to move on to the next level. So you decide to move on to business analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, in my, my definition, my working definition of what it means, this is all about learning how to analyze data with a particular data visualization, which is known as a process behavior chart. And I'm going to show you one right here. So per my uh, philosophy, notice that everything's grayscale, right? I like a high data to ink ratio in my visualizations. This chart tells you a ton with minimal color. So I, I think it's a great visualization. And what we can see here is one of the hearts of analyzing business data with Excel, which is you want to look at what the business is doing over time. Usually looking at a point in time isn't super helpful. You usually need to see the trends. You need to under, understand what's going on over time. And that's what this chart specifically is designed for. It starts with a line chart, right? This black thing is just a line chart. And that is one of the most useful and interesting things in all of data visualizations in Excel that you can use to apply to business data as a line chart. And it says, look, let's take that and let's add to it. So what it adds to it first and foremost is this average sales line here right, this dark gray line. Take these eight data points, calculate the average, plot it on the chart. And the reason for this is quite simple. The average, also known as the arithmetic mean, is the world's single most common predictive model. Right? The average is used all the time by human beings naturally to try and understand what's gonna happen in the future. For example, if I'm gonna go take a trip someplace I've never been before and I need to know what to pack in my suitcase, I'm going to go look at the average temperatures. I'm going to look at the average rainfall. I'm going to look at the average temperatures. And that's going to help guide what I'm going to pack into my suitcase. The average is a predictive model. So we plot it here because in this particular context, which is a quarterly sales chart, right? So each one of these dots is quarterly sales from 2017 through 2018. If I'm asked, hey, Dave, what do you think the sales are going to be in the first quarter of 2019? And if I have no data to go on, if this is all the stuff I know, I'm going to predict the average because why not? All things being equal, if I don't know anything else, the average is a reasonable prediction. So that's why it's on here. Next up, we add these dotted lines way up here. Right? This is what's known as an upper limit. And let me explain a little bit what this is and why it's so awesome. Based on the data that's in the chart, Based on the historical data, in this case, two years of quarterly sales, I can use a very simple plug and chug method, no fancy tables in Excel needed, just type in a little formula, drag it down, I'm good to go. And this upper limit will tell me, based on my data that's in this chart, what would I reasonably expect to see in terms of a maximum amount of quarterly sales? So this is kind of a predictive model a little bit as well, right? So it's predicting to say, look, based on this historical data, you could see sales like right here or right here or right here, and that would be totally expected. But if you see sales up above this line, whoa, put on the brakes, that is unexpected. To get really nerdy, if you see a sales number up here above this line, that is a statistically significant different sales amount. So you should pay attention to it. now. Notice I use that word statistically and statistically significant, but no fancy math is required. These things are easy to create. Now, reflexively, you can look at the bottom and that's essentially the same thing. If sales dip, if sales drop, as long as they don't go below this line, it's expected based on the historical data. And then lastly, there's these two little lines. And that's, this is what I call the happy path corridor. That is not the technical term, by the way, but that's what I call them. And what it tells you is, generally speaking, if you're working with business data, a business process that has been around for a while and is pretty stable and well-known, the vast majority of the time, your data points are going to fall inside this happy path corridor. And as you can see here, I've got eight data points and seven of the eight, other than this one, fall within the happy path corridor. And what this allows you to do is take your historical business data and put it into a rigorous context that allows you to standardize data analysis. 
in a statistically valid way, by the way, without any math, no calculus, none of that jazz. You don't have to worry about any of that. Super, super simple. So this chart is at the heart of leveling up your diagnostic game. Because imagine if you will, uh, as I said earlier, something bad happens in the business and a manager says, why did it happen? Well, these charts provide a very, very powerful way for you to standardize that analysis to under go into the data and say, what was the why of what happened? Now, next up, and this is where the charts really, really come into their own. And I mentioned this earlier. And that is for the ability to compare groups of data. So let's, let's talk a little bit what's on this slide here. So on this slide, we have monthly conversion rate. So we have monthly conversion rate for 2017 and 2018, right? 12 months worth of data. And let's just, for the sake of argument, let's assume that the conversion rate is for the website of our company, right? People come into our website, they can buy stuff on our website. What percentage of visitors that come into our website actually buy something? Record it over time, because we want to understand trends. Now, one of the things that we can do here is we can say, look, I want to compare groups. I want to understand over time, are things getting better? Or are they getting worse? So we can divide our data up into groups. So this group of data, group one, is 2017 data. Group two, 2018 data, right? Now, what I want you to kind of think of in the back of your mind is a scientific experiment, something like a drug trial, right? A company creates a new drug. They want to know if it actually works. What's the first thing they do? They create a scientific experiment where they have two groups. They have placebo, people who don't get the drug, people who do get the drug, and then they compare results. This is essentially what we're doing here, but we're doing it with a business KPI, a business metric over time. No experiment required. Awesome stuff. So let's assume for the sake of argument that management wasn't satisfied with how things were going in 2017 with our e-commerce site. So they decided to hire in a new lead product manager to take over the e-commerce site and drive up that conversion rate so we can make more money. Right. And let's say that this, this, this lady that we hire, she comes from Amazon, let's say, and she's awesome about e-commerce and conversion rates. She really knows what she's doing. And she takes over in 2018 and she leads the team and she implements a bunch of changes. Now, one of the things we want to know, not only as managers, but if you're the lead product manager, you definitely want to know is this, are the groups actually different? Now, I've emphasized that word actually, not only in my voice, but also with italic, italicized text and an underline. Because what do we mean when we say actually different? I don't mean your opinion. I don't mean my opinion. I don't mean the VP's opinion. I don't mean Bob's opinion. I mean, do we really know definitively, objectively, that these things are actually different? And with the process behavior chart, we can do that. And let me explain why. So you'll notice this... Uh, upper limit here. Remember, we've got this upper limit for the group one, right? So we have this data right here, these 12 data points. And using the chart, we calculate this line. And this line tells us, look, anything above this is really, really unexpected based on the historical data that you used in the chart. If you see some data point up here, it's unlikely to happen. So you should pay attention to it. So we have our characterization of what's going on in 2017, right? In the drug trial analogy, this would be the placebo group, let's say, right? And then we can go over here and we can say, oh, hey, Dave made this dot green. There's got to be some sort of nefarious reason why he did that. <laughs> and here's the reason why. So if we take this green dot and we imagine in our mind's eye, a green line, a dotted green line going over to the left. Do, 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 do. Notice what's happening here. This data point if you draw a line over here, is higher than the upper limit for 2017. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that, look, if the new lead product manager's changes didn't do anything, if they had no effect whatsoever, we shouldn't probably see this data point. If you think of it in the drug trial analogy, right, we would only notice a difference in the drug trial if there was a change between the placebo group with no treatment and the treatment group, the people who got the drug. In this case, the website changes are like the drug. And what we see here is, yes, 
this data point would be extremely unlikely if there wasn't a change. So what we can, def what we can definitively assert, not based on opinion, not based on you know, conjecture, not based on any of those sorts of things, we using a standardized rigorous process, we can say, look, yes, they are actually different. And if you're the lead product manager, you're like, see, I need a raise, I need a bonus, I need more stock, whatever it might be. I was successful. The data shows definitively that I was successful. And this is powerful stuff. Like I said, these charts are easy to create and they provide a standardized, rigorous way for anybody to analyze data. People might not like your findings, but they can't argue with the results or the process because they are standardized and they are mathematically sound. Dave, I don't think you can really say that that one point is based on changing the, the website at the beginning of the year. You have quite a few months before there was very much change. And if you plotted them all with just a single set of limits, that green point is still within your three sigma upper bound. Ah, so yes, there are some assumptions that are being, being made here. So for example, <clears throat> you'll notice that the month of 11, right, which is November, which is often Cyber Monday, Black Friday, often has <clears throat> a spike in the e-commerce space, right? And you'll notice that there is here. So if you plotted these all together, on one chart, they, they would all fall within the three signal limits, absolutely correct. But if you break them out and you say, hypothetically speaking, remember I said earlier that this was a optimistic presentation. Yeah, it's that, also a thought exercise. It's also a thought exercise. <clears throat> but if you split them out and you say, look, the only substantive change between 2017 <clears throat> and 2018 were the changes made by the product manager, then you can split them out separately and compare them as two separate Dave. Things. I want to say something. Yes. If you have seven consecutive points on one side of the average, this is already out of control if you, are, if you know anything about uh, statistical quality control charts. So you don't Correct. even have to wait to see if it's above or below. Correct. Uh, I, I'm a follower of Dr. J, Dr. Donald J. Wheeler, if you know who he is. He actually teaches eight points subsequently above the average line or below the average line. Yes. So I don't, I'm not going through all the detection rules. I'm just using this as an example. But yes, you're absolutely correct. That is another way to tell that something has changed in the business. And like I said earlier, these rules that we're talking about are standardized. Everybody learns the same rules. Everyone applies them to the same charts in the same way, as opposed to what you often see in data analysis, which is someone throws up a chart in a PowerPoint and they're like, see? And not everybody sees the same thing. And by the way, I will be providing a reference at the end of the, the, the presentation today that talks about how to learn these um, and it was written by Dr. Wheeler. Great questions. Please challenge me, feel free. Love it, this is great. Okay, so returning back to this call center manager analogy, right? So we've gone further down the data literacy rabbit hole and we're talking about business analysis now. And what additional things can we do as a call center manager when we've learned these techniques? So first of all, we can do something as one of the gentlemen indicated correctly, can we analyze the data and see, hey, has there actually been a sustained shift in the call volume? This would be specifically the example that the gentleman provided, right? Where we see on average for many, many months in a row, that we have shifted our call volumes. That's usually indicative that something is changed. Something fundamentally has changed in the business. Maybe for example, we've introduced a new product and that product is complicated and it's generating more customer calls than what we've seen before. You can then analyze the data in a standardized way and then go make an argument to the director of customer service, let's say, and say, look, hey, our calls have shifted. The data clearly shows that. If we don't want our customer satisfaction to go down because people are waiting longer in the queue, you need to give me budget to hire more people. Now, you might not get that. That might not be the desirable outcome that you get, but you, your director can't argue with the results. You've done it in a standardized way. You're like, yep, okay, yeah, calls have shifted, the volumes are up. Sorry, we don't have any budget. The queue times are just gonna get longer. That's just the result of it. Another thing that you could do potentially is, let's say you have a supervisor that works under you and they manage the second shift. 
because call centers often have multiple shifts, right? Morning, afternoon, overnight shifts. And let's say that this man, the supervisor is saying, look, because of my skills, I'm awesome. My team is doing better. I, I deserve a raise, I deserve a promotion, whatever it might be. You can use these tools to then evaluate that and say, look, are they really truly more efficient? So you can take a chart for the first shift and a chart for the second shift and then compare the two and actually in a rigorous standardized way say, yes or no, are they actually different? Okay. Whew. Now let's say you as the call center manager, you're like thoroughly addicted to this whole data thing. Like you're just doing it at night and on weekends on your own free time because you just love it so much. So you decide to go all the way down the rabbit hole. So last up, you add in some predictive analytics capabilities. Now, before I dive into this, I just need to caution folks that doing this doesn't necessarily require that you learn a lot of mathematics. It helps, but it is strictly speaking not required. And I will talk more about that in the next few slides. So first up, logistic regression. So logistic regression is a predictive analytics technique where the thing that you're modeling, the thing that you're trying to predict is what's known as a binary outcome. And that's a pretty simple idea. It's essentially two states, yes or no, approve or deny, legitimate or fraudulent. Right. These are very, very common in the business world. So these are often referred to as classification problems generically. And these types of problems, these types of predictive scenarios are super, super common. Is this customer likely to become a paying customer? Are they likely to convert? Yes or no? Should we approve or deny this loan application? Is this credit card authorization legitimate or fraudulent? All over the place. Very, very realistic type of thing that you would do in a business world. Now, here is a, a representation of what it looks like to do logistic regression in Excel. Now, for whatever reason, my former employer has decided not to build in logistic regression into base Excel. As we'll see next up with linear regression, those are included in the analysis tool pack, which is part of Excel out of the box. But for some reason, they didn't do it with logistic regression. I don't know why. However, building this thing is not particularly difficult. Essentially what you do is once you do it once, you essentially create essentially a template and then you just copy and paste your worksheet, tweak it a bit for your new, new model and you're off and running. It's, you know, it's quite easy once you get the hang of it. Now, what's really cool about logistic regression is that the predictions that it makes come out as a score from zero to one. And what you do is you interpret this as a percentage. 0% to 100%, even though you never actually make it a 0% or 100%, you get real close in, in, the, in some cases, but you never get quite there. But it is a very, very useful model because it's very easy for you to understand what it's trying to tell you. And it's also very easy to communicate to business decision makers what the model is trying to tell you. For example, how likely is this customer to convert to paying? on a scale from zero to 100%. If it's like 99.99%, that customer is extremely likely to convert to paying. And if it's close to zero, oof, they're not gonna convert to paying. As I mentioned, it's not present in out-of-the-box Excel. However, this is easily implemented with the solver. So as I mentioned earlier, I am a big fan of the solver. The solver <laughs> allows you to do all kinds of cool types of data analyses, not just pres prescriptive analytics, like optimizing your supply chain, but also you can use it to do market basket analysis, logistic regression. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do with it. This is super, super awesome. Now, if you're familiar at all with predictive analytics, you might be wondering why I picked this particular technique. And the reason's pretty simple. Logistic regression is one of the most common predictive models that is in production that is actually used in real world business scenarios, used on websites, used in automated processes, that sort of thing. Super, super commonly used. And the reason is, one, it's quite easy to understand, it's quite easy to implement, and it's quite powerful. So that's one predictive modeling technique that helps you explain the why of what's going on in the business. And we'll have examples with the call center manager here in a bit. So next up. Linear regression. Inside of Microsoft Excel, there is an add-on called the Analysis Tool Pack. 
you can just go into your settings and turn it on and it's awesome. And the analysis tool pad gives you a nice graphical user interface to work with a bunch of built-in Excel functionality that can be kind of a pain to work with directly. And it provides a nice, easy way for you to conduct linear regression analyses. It's built in, it's super simple. It's really easy to work with. One of the things that the analysis tool pack also provides, which is very commonly used when you do linear regression analysis, is what's known as a correlation. That's a very important concept. And what correlation talks about is a relationship between two columns of numeric variables, two columns of numbers. And it's a linear relationship. Don't worry about what that means. I'll have some graphs that will show you what that means intuitively. Now, what's really cool about this correlation idea is that it's really simple to understand. It goes from negative one to one and in between, right? It's, got, it's bounded by two extremes on negative one and one. It's really easy to understand. Specifically, negative one denotes perfect negative correlation, right? These two columns of numbers are negatively correlated perfectly. We'll, we'll see what this means in, a, in an intuitive way in a second. And a value of positive one means that these two columns of numbers are perfectly correlated in a positive way. And again, we'll see what this means with a chart. The way to think about perfect correlation is a straight line relationship. If you guys have ever used a trend line in any of your charts in Excel, what it's showing you is the correlation, right? It's technically, it's also a linear regression model, but it's also showing you the correlation. So this will seem really familiar once you see these charts. And uh, what's awesome, as I mentioned, is that doing correlation analysis is extremely easy using the analysis tool pack. Okay, so here's an example of perfect positive correlation. And what we can see here is yet another contrived example to be sure, which is I have degrees Celsius on the x-axis and degrees Fahrenheit on the y-axis. I got temperature data. And not surprisingly, if I know the temperature in degrees Celsius, I can perfectly predict, I can perfectly calculate what the temperature is in degrees Fahrenheit. And if I ask Excel to chart this and then add a trend line, it gives me this nice straight trend line. And this is a correlation of one. As degrees Celsius goes up, so do degrees Fahrenheit. And there is a perfect mathematical relationship between the two of them as evidenced by this perfectly straight trend line. Next up, we have negative correlation, which essentially is like a downward slope. Now, I have another contrived example here. Uh, I live in Montana in the middle northern part of the United States, and it is very cold. Like it's negative six Fahrenheit right outside right now. <laughs> it's very cold in Montana, which inspired this chart. And what you can see here is something that makes a lot of sense, right? If I have the average daily temperature in degrees Fahrenheit on the x-axis and my monthly energy bill on the y-axis, you can tell that I spend a lot more money in, in the winter to heat my home than I do in the summer. So I get this downward relationship. And notice the trend line here doesn't go through all the data points. So my correlation isn't perfect like it is up here, but it's pretty good, right? It's close to the theoretical minimum of negative one because most of the dots are very close to this trend line. So you know a lot more about trend lines now if you weren't familiar with them. And then lastly, we have this idea of no correlation, which is a correlation of zero. And basically what this says is, look, there is no discernible relationship between these two things, right? Now notice that this is important because correlation is a proxy. It's not perfect, but it is a proxy for being able to predict stuff. And being able to predict stuff accurately helps you understand the why of what's going on in the business. So for example, if you're in HR, this is, as Dolly can tell you, this is one of my favorite examples. If you work in HR, you might want to understand how do you predict bad attrition? How do you predict a good employee is going to leave you? Are there certain things that you need to know? And that gives you some insight into what's going on in the business. Maybe you implement a new HR process to combat that situation. So this is extremely important. It's a foundational part of predictive analytics with linear regression. Okay, so you got that. That's in the analysis tool pack. It does a lot of good things for you. It's really super useful for analyzing data. And then lastly, we've got linear regression here. So linear regression is about predicting numbers. So logistic regression is about predicting yes, no, approve, deny, that sort of thing. Linear regression is all about predicting things like sales and price and weight. 
It's anything with a decimal point in it, basically. Now, what's really cool is that, as I mentioned, the analysis tool pack makes it real easy to conduct linear regression analyses. Now, the key to this is simple, right? There are many software packages in the world that are used by folks to conduct linear regression analyses. Excel is one, R, Python, SPSS, SAS, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. The software typically handles the math for you. And as I said earlier, understanding the math is certainly useful, but it is not required. What's more important is that you understand the concepts and you let Excel handle the math. An example that I frequently use is social scientists like sociologists and psychologists use linear regression analysis all the time. They do not typically have three semesters of calculus and a bunch of statistics courses. What they're typically taught is how to use a software tool and then taught the concepts on how to apply it appropriately. And that's what you do when you use linear regression with Excel. So for example, you have the adjusted R squared metric here. You don't actually need to know how it's calculated exactly to actually use it effectively. You just need to understand how to interpret it and how to understand what it means. That's what's most important. Similarly with the significance of F, that's also something that you don't need to understand in depth right away or maybe ever. Just You just need to understand how to apply it. What does it mean? That's what's most important. Now, what's cool about linear regression is that it allows you to conduct some super powerful analyses. Once again, we're using the IRIS data set, as I used before. And what, what I've got here highlighted in green is I'm saying, look, hey, if you take the interaction of the length of the petal and the length of the sepal, which is like the little flower part of the flower, and if you if they interact together, is that actually significant from a prediction perspective? And that might be a bit, bit abstract. So let me cement it with a different idea that might help out. Imagine this was radio advertising spend and this was television advertising spend in the same city, let's say the same geography. You might have a hypothesis. You might have an idea as a marketing person that, you know what? Hey, if we advertise on both radio and television at the same time, they're like chocolate and peanut butter. They're better together. They're better than separate. They interact together. They have a synergy, if you will. And linear regression allows you to try stuff like that out using your data, see if it actually bears out in the data. And then lastly, you can learn about things like, hey, not only can I find out about you know, a, an evaluation of this interaction effect, but I can also get like a plausible range of values and that it just helps give more insight into what's going on in the business. Now, linear regression, like logistic regression is super, super popular. Uh, I use the word arguably here, but realistically, linear regression is the most widely used predictive modeling technique in the world, hands down. Everybody uses it. Business people use it. Sociologists use it. Psychologists use it. Economists use it. Everyone uses linear regression. It's a wildly, wildly useful tool. And you can use it effectively in Excel. You have to learn about some of the limitations, of course. But again, you learn about the concepts, not necessarily about the underlying mathematics unless you want to. And then lastly, what can this business analyst do? Oh, excuse me, this um, call center manager that decides to be a citizen business analyst. When they add in these techniques, they can answer some really super interesting questions. So for example, as you as a call center manager, if you can get the data, which is becoming easier and easier all the time with like self-service BI platforms, you could create a logistic regression model that says, look, hey, we have customers that churn, right? They leave our company for a competitor. What are the factors that are highly predictive of churn? And if, and if I find anything there, what can customer service do to help out? That's a very proactive thing that you could do from a data analysis perspective. If you're not familiar with CSAT, that stands for customer satisfaction. It's just another metric commonly used in the customer service space. So for example, you could create another logistic regression model and say, hey, look, what are the factors under customer services control associated with CSAT? And typically what you do here is you change a number score into a yes, no. Like for example, any score over seven is yes, and any score below seven is a no. And then you can use logistic regression for that. With linear regression, you can do things like, hey, what are the critical factors that affect staffing levels, right? So you can imagine 
measuring the total number of person hours accumulated in, during the various shifts in your call center. And you can look at things like time of day, day of the week, holidays, product launches, website outages, whatever it might be that you have access to from your data and say, look, what are these things? What are the things that actually affect my staffing levels? Because then I can maybe build a more interesting, more powerful way to forecast how many people I need in the future. And then lastly, we can say, hey, coming back to this idea of like, maybe call lengths differ based on factors like product line or um, things like that, geography. We can say, look, could we handle more calls if we actually had a different mix of agents? So for example, if we had more 401k specialists and less checking account specialists, for example, in the bank, maybe we could handle a higher volume of calls at a particular service level. Whew. Okay, that's it. Okay, that's it for, the, <laughs> that's it for all the, the hard sell of the coolness of all this stuff. If you're interested in learning more, I wanna provide you with some resources to learn some more. So for example, if you're interested in learning data visualizations, uh, I have a seven part tutorial series on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can use this bitly here, or you can just go to YouTube and search on my name, David Langer. I'm the first YouTube channel that comes up. I have a seven part series that talks about how you use Excel to do essentially diagnostic analytics with things like histograms and box plots and scatter plots and that sort of thing. So if you wanted to go to the power user level, this is a resource for you. Per a couple of the gentlemen's com comments earlier, if you're interested in learning about how to use the process behavior chart, this is the book to get by Donald J. Wheeler. He's a luminary in the field of statistical process control where these charts come from. These things have been used in manufacturing, for example, and quality control for nearly 100 years now. So they've been around a long time, but they're not commonly used in the business world. Dr. Wheeler said, actually, you can use these in the, in the business world. So you can check this book out. Uh, unfortunately, this book is nowadays is kind of difficult to get. Um, it's, it's print status is, is, um, is kind of complicated. So usually what you want to do if you're interested in buying the book is you want to check Amazon periodically to see when they refresh the stock because oftentimes uh, used booksellers will sell this for hundreds of dollars. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for it. <laughs> Wait for it to come in stock and get it for the normal price of around $80 US. Now, this book is awesome because it makes no assumptions about your math background. It makes no assumptions about what tool you use. The book is very, very amenable to an Excel user to learn how to do these charts. Next up, if you're interested in learning more about logistic and linear regression, this is a great book from by a gentleman by the name of Wayne Winston. It's called Marketing Analytics, and it has it's a big, fat, thick book, and it covers many, many topics in marketing analytics using Excel, two of the things that it covers are linear and logistic regression. However, the one caveat is this survey book, this is a survey book, so it doesn't have in-depth content. And unfortunately, there really isn't a lot of in-depth content on logistic regression right now in the industry, but this is probably the most accessible source if you're interested in that sort of thing. However, the news is much better for linear regression. If you're interested in learning linear regression, this is the book to get. It's by Jim Frost, and it's an intuitive guide, and it is an intuitive guide. So Jim Frost has a master's in statistics, and he teaches linear regression with minimal math. He uses charts, he uses graphs, he uses concepts to teach you all about linear regression analysis. And this book is wildly, wildly accessible to basically any professional that's interested in learning more about this. One thing I should mention is that in the book, he uses a software package called Minitab, but he doesn't actually do anything that's exceedingly Minitab specific. He just uses it to create his charts and his visualizations that he talks about in the book. Just about everything that he shows in Minitab can be done in Excel, either directly with the analysis tool pack, or um, you create the charts manually yourself and they're not all that difficult. And if you're interested in getting that book, which is only like about 15 bucks US last time I checked, you can get an ebook from his website here at statisticsbygym.com. And lastly, if you're interested in more stuff that I talk about, I talk a lot about data literacy and what you can do with Excel. Uh, I, I'm a LinkedIn enthusiast, so you, I put a lot of content on LinkedIn and I have many, many Excel-based tutorials on my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in learning more, you can use those both as resources. 
Okay, that was a whirlwind tour of hands-on data literacy with Excel. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I really appreciate it. And I will go ahead and open up the floor to any questions. Awesome. Cheers, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> it's just, I didn't realize he was talking and it was just, uh, <laughs> I should know that voice well, shouldn't I? Yeah. Um, so like, oh, sorry. sorry. No, go on, Dave. Go I was just, I was just going to say, look, don't underestimate the power of Excel, right? This is coming from a software engineer, professional data scientist type guy. Excel can do all kinds of wickedly awesome stuff. So don't underestimate it. Cool. Um, in regards to questions in the chat, and there was one or two, but I think they all got handled, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody wants to, you know, if anybody wants to ask a question or, or, you know, or just open up some kind of dialogue here. Um, feel free, uh, feel free to jump in and start speaking. Can I try one? Peter Bartholomew here. That Please, do you yeah. have much place for extrapolation as opposed to interpolation, forecasting? Or... Uh, so let me. So when you say forecasting, I want to be. I don't want to be a little bit pedantic. So forgive me. Okay. Are you talking about time time series forecasting in particular? Uh, yes. Yeah. So that unfortunately is not one of my areas of speciality. So I would hesitate to comment too much on time series forecasting. I, there is functionality in, um, in Excel for doing forecast time series forecasting. Wayne Winston, the, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, he has another book. I'm looking at it right here on my desk. It's called Data Analysis and Business Modeling from Wayne Winston. Mm -hmm. He talks about how to do time series forecasting using Excel. Now, in terms of interpolation, so interpolation, if you're not familiar, is this idea of like, I, I only have so many data points and I wanna create a model that will allow me to predict values in between the data points that I have. Now, interpolation is a um, complicated topic from a predictive modeling perspective. Certain techniques work better than others. For example, linear regression is a very, very good technique for interpolation. Uh, various machine learning algorithms don't actually do that very well. So typically what you want to do is use what is known as parametric techniques, traditional statistical techniques, they tend to work better for interpolation. Thank you. And Peter, let me know if I didn't answer your question, by the way. Don't no, that's, that's fine. You know, hold me I've, accountable. I've come across various things with adding seasonality and uh, adding layers of complexity. Uh, you know, that uh, I just you know, was fishing to see whether you had opinions on them. Uh, yes. So like I said, time series forecasting is not my forte. Um, what, I can tell, yeah. what I can tell you is at a high level, state of the art, um, in the industry is starting to move towards using, like you said, these very deep layered models. Um, for example, there are a lot of frameworks out now that use deep neural networks that allow, that are able to use all of these different factors simultaneously, usually often, I should say usually, often more effectively than more traditional techniques. Um, there's been, Two questions, I think, in the chat, Dave. I'm not sure if you can see them. One from Jess, who wants to hear a little bit more about your views on Solver. Lots of Excel experts don't seem to have a lot of time for it. Uh, solver. Oh, wow. <laughs> I thought I was pretty clear on my thoughts about the Solver. <laughs> um, so if you, if you want to use Excel, to the hilt as a data analysis tool, you have to use the solver. That's basically it. But notice that I said, if you want to use Excel to the hilt as an analytics tool, because not everybody needs to, quite frankly, and that's, that's okay. But for example, um, sophisticated Monte Carlo simulations, financial modeling, uh, market basket analysis, logistic regression, there's a whole series of more advanced analytical techniques that can be implemented and they require the use of the solver in addition to the more traditional like supply chain optimization stuff that I mentioned earlier too, which is a whole other thing, right? That's a whole career path in of itself where they use different types of optimization techniques. So 
my, 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 my response to that would be is depends on what your career goals are. If you're interested in maximizing Excel's utility as a data analysis tool, then the solver is definitely something that you uh, should be interested in. And by the way, I have a tutorial on my YouTube channel that shows you how to use the solver to do market basket analysis. And it's a quick and free, easy way to kind of look and see what's possible with the solver. And if you hit the limits within Excel, then you can also get uh, other copies, can't you? That it's, I think there's limits to 100 variables or something, whereas you can go to the company that produces it and get more powerful versions. Yes, and uh, as I also mentioned as well, um, and this might sound a bit radical. Some some folks who are familiar with my content, they will know about. They know they know what I'm about ready to say. Uh, at some point, you, moving from Excel to R, the R programming language, for example, is actually a lot easier than you would think. And then all those limitations go away. And it's also a free tool. So there's always that as well, right? You yeah. can use Excel, scale up to a certain point, and then you can move to R. Because for example, Excel code looks an awful lot like R code. It's not as difficult as people might think. So prototype in Excel and then move on. Or if, if, if Excel is all you need, then yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, move, don't move away from it. Um, but I have, I have content around how Excel users can move to things like SQL and R, and it's a lot easier than people might think. Uh, Solver has some idiosyncrasies that may get tough to use. I'd be interested in, interested in knowing more about what those are specifically. Um, I haven't run any myself, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's idiosyncrasies. It's been too long for me to remember what they are, hmm. but I used to use it an awful lot. And there were certain things that if you didn't do it exactly right, you would get an answer that was inconsistent with your whole analysis. Yeah, that's something that's, to do with how, how, how you set your uh, conditions or something. And uh, sometimes yeah. if, you, if you set it for a maximum or a minimum, it wouldn't exactly work right. So you had to actually say, less than zero and it would get close to a minimum or things like that. And I just don't remember what they are. Yeah. And that, 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 mm. that doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. Like for example, there's a, there's a book you can buy that's all about how to do various like supply chain optimization problems using the solver. And you have to follow the steps exactly. <laughs> it just doesn't work. So what you're describing doesn't surprise me at all. Right. Let's see. we got some conversations about Google sheets. Never really used it myself, to be honest, so I can't really comment on Google Sheets at all. There's a question from Dolly, just a little bit further up, though. Oh, Dolly. Uh, hey, Dolly. Uh, what do you think of BI software vendors Ooh. who declare that traditional BI tools like Excel and using dashboards is dead and recommend moving to cloud live analytics? <laughs> uh, don't believe it. <laughs> uh, it's quite frankly. As I was mentioning to Alan and Tia, so I've been around a long time, like I talked about. My very first job was programming COBOL on a mainframe as a software engineer. And COBOL and mainframes are still around to this day. They're still around. And here's the thing. The market penetration of COBOL in the mainframe is nothing like Excel. So it's probably a safe bet that Excel is going to be around for a while. The estimates are 700 million users worldwide. Seven hundred million. <laughs> Not to sound like Charlton Heston, but something about cold dead hands comes to mind when I think about that. So very true. <laughs> that being said, uh, I would be the first one to tell you that Excel is an awesome tool and it can do lots of things. Um, and I've got tutorials on my YouTube channel that shows all so what's possible. One of the problems with Excel, quite frankly, is that people use it oftentimes in ways it shouldn't be used, right? That's the same with any tool, right? I can try and drive a nail with a screwdriver. I can do that. It's not gonna work real well, but I can do it. So th that problem is not Excel specific. Excel just gets a bum rap because it's so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So one thing I would say is use Excel for the things that it's good at. And when it's not, use your Excel skills and then jump into other tools like SQL and R where the constraints don't exist anymore. Yeah, good job. John says 700 million is an underestimate. <laughs> Could very well be. 700 million is still a real big number. So that's the one I'll use. <laughs> yeah. 
one percent of those is your customer base and you're doing well aren't you in fact you wouldn't be able to time to touch the ground oh peter peter you're giving away my trade secrets here man <laughs> i can if i can train one percent of excel users on data analysis whew, that's a pretty good business yeah <laughs> Anything at all, guys, you can like ask me anything. Is machine learning a real thing? Is AI a real thing? Whatever you want. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so John's correcting here, 750 million users in 2017, okay. I think your estimate counts as just about spot on then, doesn't it? I think I saw uh, something <laughs> recently that said a, a billion, but uh, that was oh. rounding up, I guess. But, yeah. Right. Well, you okay, know, a, like, bi- a billion sounds impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. So uh, I, 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 I contribute a lot on like social media on LinkedIn, right? And so I get a lot of Excel haters. So I tend to, of use, course. More con- I tend to use more conservative numbers <laughs> estimates because I get a lot of haters. Just say you're you're only counting the paid users. Oh, right there, you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Microsoft. Ooh. Okay, we got another question in predictive analytics. How do you account for once in a generation things like pandemic wars, etc.? This is a good question. So, the thing about predictive analytics, if you're not familiar, is is this. Past performance is indicative of future performance. Un- unlike what Fidelity would tell you on a s- stock prospectus, that is the underlying assumption of all predictive models. So when you have shocks to the system, things like the, pay- the global pandemic, predictive models break. They break. And this has been widely published. You can like Google it and find all kinds of articles about predictive models breaking all over industry because it was unprecedented. The historical data didn't prepare for this. So there are a number of techniques that you can um, use to try and combat combat this idea that, look, the pandemic broke my model. The data is completely different. Customer behaviors are different. Sales are different. You know, all that sort of thing. Um, imagine Microsoft, right? They've got a curve for their team's sales. And then all of a sudden, whoop, <laughs> they didn't expect that, I'm sure. So there's many techniques that you can do for that. And typically what you want to do is um, one technique you can do is use, as I mentioned before, some of these models, these time series models that are built on top of more complicated algorithms. There's one called causal impact that will allow you to put multiple different time series in. And then what it does is it will actually try and blend them to kind of accommodate some of those shocks if you've got the right kinds of data series. But it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. Bill is quoting uh, George Box, a famous statistician, where he said, all models are wrong, some are useful. So yeah, that's George Box who said that. Very brilliant man, 100% correct. All models are wrong, some are useful. Dave, I know you, uh, your, your YouTube channel's got lots of like program stuff on it. Do you consider like Excel the sort of core of like a analytics and then things sort of going out from that, like Power BI, SQL, R? Yes. So take this as one person's opinion, of course, right? I don't want to pretend like I'm bringing truth from the mountaintop or anything like that. So Excel is still a extremely valuable skill. So there are... For example, I've got a couple of videos on my YouTube channel where I went and looked at 25 senior data analyst positions at Amazon. I went and actually looked at each one of their job descriptions individually, and I took stock of all the things that they talked about, all the skills that they required. And Excel was the top, as I recall, the top skill. And then I looked at data scientist positions at Facebook at the time, and Excel was also extremely common. Now, that being said, depending on where your career goals are, Excel might be all you need. So for example, many financial analysts, Excel's all they need. That's all they do. They might use more advanced techniques like Monte Carlo simulation in Excel, but that's all they use is Excel. Other types of jobs, 
they typically want to branch out. So for example, in the 25 job descriptions I looked at Amazon, Excel was top. Next up, SQL, SQL. Can you query relational databases? Then some sort of data visualization tool, right? So Tableau, Power BI, um, I think Amazon's tool is called QuickSight, you know, that sort of thing. So yes, Excel is kind of like, um, if you will, if you don't mind the analogy, Excel is your analytics gateway drug. <laughs> so you can do a lot with Excel, but depending on your career goals, it eventually you need to branch out. And the good news is that your Excel skills, your Excel knowledge actually makes acquiring some of these other technologies much easier than you might think. At times when I look cynically at it and think, what is the limitation in this uh, usage? And it isn't the package, it isn't Excel, it's the user. So uh, yeah, prove to me that the user has outgrown Excel and we move on. Well, so like one example, one practical example is, is that um, you can do market basket analysis in Excel using the solver. The problem oftentimes with doing certain types of analysis in Excel is it just becomes unwieldy to deal with lots of mm -hmm. columns and lots of rows, right? So that's not that, not that yeah. Excel can't do it, but the, the chance that the human being is going to make a bug goes up dramatically just because Excel doesn't scale very well based on the nature of the program. So there are some legitimate, I would argue, technical things that come into play there. But yes, always start with the human, always start with the human. Uh, let's see, Russell. Russell, buddy, what's up? Uh, yes, Excel is definitely the Swiss Army knife of data. That's for sure. I know <laughs> about that. Uh, from Eve, what are thoughts on data cleaning in Excel prior to analysis? Any quick strategies? I find I spend more time cleaning and structuring it before I can clean any analysis. <laughs> and Mike responds, Power Query. Yes, Power Query. Um, so years and years ago, they did an academic study back when data science was called data mining, where they essentially took a survey of professionals' time to figure out what they spent most of their time doing. And back then, the estimate was anywhere between 60 to 80% of their time was data management activities, acquiring data, cleaning data, understanding data, rinse and repeat. It's true today as it ever was. That doesn't change. Um, much to, I don't know if you guys are familiar with DEMA, which is the Data Management Association, and much to their chagrin, they haven't really fix that problem yet of data quality everywhere. So Power Query, by far and away, um, awesome thing to have in your tool belt if you use data for analysis, Excel for data analysis. Power Query is awesome for data cleaning, munging, transformation. You can do a lot without even actually learning the M language itself. It's, it's super, super awesome. Oh, and by the way, I have a tutorial on my YouTube channel that teaches you how to do K-means cluster analysis using Power Query, just another example of how useful it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about Excel's new Lambda feature? Okay, if you're not familiar, Excel is trying to become what's known as Turing complete. It wants to be a programming language, a legitimate programming language like any other programming language. And what they've added is the Lambda function, which is a function that allows you to create your own custom functions. So Lambda is potentially super, super powerful. Um, the only reason why I'm hesitating is because I'm a trained computer scientist and I've looked into Lambda and it's super useful, but it is ripe for abuse. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> if you thought these huge formulas that you see in Excel worksheets are terrible now, Lambda has the potential to make it just essentially even worse. Um, unless there's good software, um, mm. unless there's good software engineering practices in place. Huh. Say a few more words about that, because I, I found my average length of formulas now up to about 10, 15 lines. That's, uh, that's, uh, so here's the thing. Even before Lambda, Excel was the world's most popular programming environment by far and away. Strictly speaking, even before Lambda came in, the combination mm -hmm. of Worksheets and functions in Excel was sufficient condition to qualify it as a programming language environment. So once you get there and you start doing anything that's not, not relatively simple, anything that's reasonably complicated, software engineering principles apply. And unfortunately, because of the nature of Excel, it's not really set up 
to actually allow you to engineer complicated formulas in a way that actually make them quite maintainable, which is why you see so many memes <laughs> about Excel, that sort of thing. Um, so there comes a point where I would argue as well that, um, you know, if you find yourself writing tons and tons of super complicated formulas regularly that no one else can maintain bug free other than you, you might want to think about like, are there other things that I might, that might be more efficient for me to use instead? Um, for example, um, and I'm totally making this up, it might not apply to your situation. Can I use SQL, an embedded SQL query instead to actually pull and massage the data and then pull it into a table by a power query or something like that instead? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. The recently released advanced formula environment is great with Lambda. Yep, yeah, I've only taken a look at that just briefly. I haven't really dived into it, but yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, Lambda equals UDFs without VBA. Yep, exactly, user-defined functions. Yep, exactly right, without VBA. If, if John's still on the line, I've seen him stating that uh, he can replace most of his VBA graphics routines with Lambda functions now? No, 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 not my graphics routines, just my UDFs. Oh. Not quite all of them. There's a couple oh, that okay, are yeah. too complicated and I'm not smart enough to do that, but <laughs> the, the charting routines are, uh, Lambda doesn't, doesn't touch that. Lambda just does uh, calculations. Yeah. yeah, and that okay. and that that I wouldn't find surprising, right? I yeah. mean, that was kind of the intent of Lambda was to be essentially, uh, if you know, Excel's out of the box function set. Can we create an environment where you can create your own user defined functions and then you don't need to go into VBA anymore? And as a confession, I haven't written VBA since 2004. So <laughs> I am by no means an expert on VBA. <laughs> Rich data types are awesome. They are indeed. Yeah. They are indeed. I haven't written VBA since Monday. <laughs> and it's Tuesday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Not that I have anything that's VBA in particular, by the way, because I used to write VB, Visual Basic 6.0. I wrote a lot of Visual Basic 6.0 in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I have no problem with Visual Basic, generally speaking. You need a lot of event handlers, so then I don't think there is another way to go. That uh, I don't, don't the JavaScript doesn't seem to handle it, and so it's VBA or nothing, just about. If you want to stay within within the confines of Excel, yeah, that's, yeah. it's yeah. it's really is the primary programming language, yeah. I'm going to close down the YouTube stream, I think, at this time. Okay. Time to shut that. Loads of comments coming in, more further up. <laughs>